from YouTube. Can online hear me now? Can online hear me? We no, not right now. <laughs> one moment, one moment, everyone. How is the streaming this bad from this? I never thought campus internet was this bad. Wow. It gets worse, too. Okay. So, sorry. Sorry, the block is so high. Okay, so here's the most important thing. Wow, this frame. It actually looks to be getting better. Look at the bottom scroll. Is the bottom scroll getting better? Yeah. Okay, what I think the issue was, I think I'm actually moving now at a decent speed. I'm just playing with my hair. So, I think... Well, I think we're fixing up. I think we're improving. But the issue was is that my computer was converting the video from Zoom. And so a lot of my processor power was going to the Zoom conversion. And this little MacBook Air is not the thing you want to be streaming hardcore on. You don't want to be going crazy, which apparently I have decided to push it to the limit with this Mac MacBook Air. And so it is, it is not happy about that. But So let's see if this works. I'm a little afraid. Everyone can hear me now, right? This is my first time actually trying this from campus. Usually I do it from my place, and I would have thought campus would be a lot better, a lot quicker, a lot smoother. So, and I'm looking at how much we're lagging. Oh no. I haven't even moved my hand in the thing with the, like, what is the lag on this? Oh. Let's let's reload the page. Um, let's go ahead and reload the page right here, and let's see what the lag is. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, six, one thousand, seven, one thousand, eight, one thousand, nine, one thousand. There's a nine-second delay. Um, we are currently in HBB three hundred two. Hmm. I really would have thought this would not have as many problems. Like, I wouldn't think we would, because uh, I've done this with this computer before. OK. So no, I'm sorry, Mark. I am sorry, Mark. OK, we're just going to give it a second here. We're going to make sure. <laughs> I agree with John. They're like, eh, it's all right. Does anyone have a MacBook Pro I can install everything on? And hey. <laughs> okay. Here's the biggest thing. Here is the biggest thing with this Kahoot review. What I want to reinforce with all of this is the most important thing, and hopefully everything starts coming, start extra points. We'll be starting here in about uh, 640, so just a tiny bit right here. But as I talk through this, the Kahoot is secondary. As we go through this, what's the most important thing? Understanding. Understanding it. So online, please ask those questions. Everyone in the chat, the most important thing is, can you hear me? So we're going to take away the scroll at the bottom. You get to see everything behind here. And so we take away the scroll. Oh, geez. Now, well, they're going to crash our Kahoot. I'm going to hit start on the Kahoot. I was supposed to hit start first. That's what I shouldn't do. So the code's up there. Oh, please don't crash our Kahoot. This is gonna be... So we're going to slow down and we're going to do this question right here. This is one of the toughest questions. So let's start the Kahoot right here and do this tough question. I'll read it out loud. The probability of getting a multiple choice question correct is 80%. With five questions, what is the probability you get at least one wrong? And so online, try to answer it right here. But I'm going to explain how to do this and I want you to type it in the chat. This is one of the hardest questions with probability you have. And actually, we seem to be streaming better now. Yes, we're catching up. So let's talk about what we would do to solve this problem. So to solve this problem right here, if we talk about the probability you get at least one wrong, 
then what are we talking about? At least one wrong can be described as you don't get them all what? You don't get them all correct. Does everyone see right here the probability you will either get at least one or at least one wrong or you will get them all correct? Just think about this. Can you get every single multiple choice question correct on the exam? You can. So you can get every single one of them correct. What would be the probability of getting them all correct? 0.8 raised to the fifth power. Now that's not the answer to the question. The answer to the question would be everything but getting them all correct. Because you will either get them all correct or you will get, and we're actually streaming decently now, you will either get them all correct or at least one wrong. So we have to take the complement of this and we're going to do a big review on this question right here to make sure people understand it. And feel free to type these answers in the chat. But this right here is the probability of getting at least one wrong. Let's see how many got it. And let's try some more examples in the chat. And chat, feel free to chime in. These are your times to do practice problems right here. And we see here that the answer is the blue one. So let's pull open the calculator here and double check our work. So what is 0.8 to the fifth power? What is 0.8 to the fifth power? Try solving this in your calculator right now. Do we have a beeping? Oh, I think it might be. So 0.8 to the fifth power, which apparently I can't type in the thing today. 0.8 to the fifth power is going to be in chat. Feel free to chime in. You got this chat is 0.32, so if you want to, you can, you can figure out whose phone it is. Oh, it is your phone? Awesome. Thank you, chat. Cheyenne, thank you very much. And chat chiming in, helping out. And now what do we do if we want to find the probability of getting at least one wrong? Because what is 0.32 right here? What is 0.32? Remember what we did? When you take an exam, and I'm going to pause on this question because I want, I want you guys to give the questions right here. I want you to think about how we're doing this because I know many people get to these test questions when it says at least one. So when we get to an at least one test question, how do we handle it? What I want you to write down first is the event that you get everything correct. So the event that you get everything correct on the exam would be you get the first correct and you get the second correct and you get the third correct and you get the fourth, and you get the fifth. And when I say and, what are we using? Multiplication. So that would be here simply the probability of 0.8 times the probability of 0.8 times the probability of 0.8. It's all these 0.8 times each other's. And we see right here, here is the probability. But that is the probability you get everything correct. You will either get everything correct, or you will get at least one wrong. So how do we find the complement of everything correct? Jonathan, nice job in the chat right there. You would do 1 minus the probability of getting everything correct. So we see right here the probability is 0 0.672, 0 0.672. You either get everything correct or at least one wrong. You guys ready for another question? Please ask those questions in the chat. Thank you, everyone, joining in right here. It's going to be interesting. we got 430, 434 people watching. Let's see, we got Focused Bobcat behind Champion uh, Urchin. Interesting names right there. And the next question is, and I love this one, two events that can be easily added together must be what? Two events that can be easily added together must be, and I like that you guys have to compete with the YouTube thing right here. Two events that can be easily added together must be what? They must be what of each other? If we can easily add two events, and hint, there are two correct answers on this screen that mean the same thing. Two events that can be easily added together must be what of each other? And the answer is they must either be disjoint or they must be mutually exclusive. Oh no, we really need to pause on this one. Because when you look at the responses on this, it was basically a random guess. That is a scary response right here. So are you guys online ready to review this question? Now, here's what we need to do. Let's focus in on this right here. So make sure to only talk quietly because, or there you are. 
So with this right here, when we have two events that can be easily added together, we are talking about the addition rule. The addition rule requires that things must be uh, mutually exclusive or disjoint for us to add them together. <laughs> so what does disjoint mean? Do you guys know my trick for disjoint? It's if one event happens, the other event, what? Does not happen. So this is funny, you guys are seeing the delay I'm seeing, it's fun to kind of deal with online. So when one event happens, the other doesn't happen. So let's talk about grades in the class. Are grades disjoint? Like if you get an A, can you get a B? If you get an A, can you also get a B? You cannot. If you were to pass the class, can you also fail the class? You can't. So these are disjoint events. I see a great question online. Uh, Sydney asks, dependent and one can happen if the other happens. So disjoint events are disjoint events dependent or independent. Be taking notes while we go through this. Disjoint events are very, 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 very what? Disjoint events are very, very, very dependent. Because if you make an A, do you know if you made a B? If you made an A, you definitely did not make a B. Wouldn't making an A depend on making a B? And disjoint is the same thing as mutually exclusive. Those are synonymous words. But disjoint events are dependent because making an A depends on making a B. If you find out you made a B on the test, imagine I call you up and I say, I don't know why I'm calling you up, but I send you an email and I say, you made a B on the test. Would you then say, did, did I make an A on the test? Because you know by making a B, did you make an A on the test? You did not because making a B on the test and making an A on the test are what events? Disjoint events. They are dependent, but they are mainly disjoint when we talk about if one happens. So write that down for disjoint. In disjoint events, if one happens, the other cannot happen. So let's talk about owning a cat and a dog. <laughs> Thanks, John. And let's say the probability of someone owning a cat and the probability of someone owning a dog. Are those disjoint events? No, and, and practice with it. Can you own a cat? Can you also own a dog? Yes. How about owning a cat and owning no animal? Are those disjoint events? You are correct. Can you own a cat and also own no animals? You are correct. You notice how we do this right here. I own a cat, well then I can't own no animals. When you answer yes to a disjoint event, all other disjoint events are no by default. Can the Patriots simultaneously win and lose the same game? Besides the fact that they can't lose, they can't win and lose the game. I'm making some enemies here in chat today. So if you said the Patriots won the game, your friend would not say, did they lose? Because your friend knows that that is a what event? Disjoint event. As soon as you say they won, it automatically means they did not lose. So if we're asked the probability of two disjoint events both happening, it would be zero. Chrissy answers a great trick question right here to say what is the probability the Patriots win and lose the same game? The probability would be zero. It can't, it's a trick question. We have done it in the past every once in a while because disjoint events can't both happen. So we'll do some more questions right here. Keep asking them in the chat. Thank you, Chrissy. Excellent question. All your questions will be answered. Was there also one in class? I thought there was. I thought I saw a hand a moment ago. The next, we've got Witty Rooster and Knowing Bat. Of course, Knowing Bat is winning. And there will be winners online and in class because in class might see the questions first. Remember to email me if you win. Two events that have no influence on the probability of each other. This is now a review question. Two events that have no influence on each other are said to be what? They have no influence on each other. Two events that, I oh, like that, Focus Bat, Focus Bob guys, like some of them. Two events that have no influence. They do not influence each other in the slightest. And this one you should almost, I want to see so many people get this answer right. They have no influence on each other. What are we talking about here? If these two events have no influence on each other, we would say that the two events are independent of each other. So ask yourself this. Let's say we say the probability of you uh, studying before the exam. Maybe it's like uh, 60% or something like that. So write down probability studying before exam. So we know a student maybe studies or does not study. Now the probability of getting an A on the exam. Are those independent or dependent events? They are dependent because would you say 
that your grade is independent of your studying? We'd hope not. How about things like this? The probability that uh, it's snowing outside today and the probability that it's 10 degrees. That'd be dependent events because snowing depends on temperature. Now, I want you to ask yourself this for dependent to find out if it's dependent or independent. So to find out if something is independent or dependent, ask yourself one of the things. It is snowing today. Does that change my idea of what the temperature is? Yes, so your idea of temperature is dependent on snow. It doesn't mean you know the temperature if it's snowing, but wouldn't it give you some information? That's what dependent is. But what is independent? Independent is when it gives you no information. So if two events are independent, and the way to test yourself on this is to say, what is the probability of Brian eating Burger King for lunch? We don't have any of here anymore. And what is the probability of Brian's brother? We shouldn't use my brother because he's related to me. What is the probability that a random student in California eats Burger King for lunch? You know Brian ate Burger King for lunch. Does that tell you anything about that person? What they did for lunch is completely what a Brian did for lunch. Completely independent. It gave you no information. How about we say your score on the Stats 201 exam and another student's score on their chemistry exam? Would those scores be independent? They would be. Does knowing your score on the Stats 201 exam give you information on the score for a student? It does? I hope not. <laughs> it does not give you information on another student's score on their chemistry exam. So with this in mind, independent means it gives you no information. I will say there's a lag for the question. No, I know there's time to lag. Sorry, guys. Uh, when they think they're studying. So if you're asked that the probabilities of two both independents happening. Um, so this is the thing right here. Chrissy brings up a great question. When we say that events are independent, what rule can we use with them? This is a great note to take if you don't have it. When events are independent, we can use the multiplication rule. So independent events can be multiplied together. And the key word would be and, to say what is the probability that you make an A on your stats test and another random student makes an A on their chemistry test. Why can I multiply those two events? Because those two events are what of each other? Those two events are independent. To multiply two events, they must be independent. Listen to the question. We know the probability of you making an A is 60%, because you're here in the Kahoot. The probability of that student making A on their chemistry exam is 10%. What is the probability that you make an A on your stats exam and they make an A on their chemistry exam? Go ahead and try to figure it out right now. Once again, I'll repeat the question, try to figure it out and type it in chat. The probability that you make an A on your stats exam is 60%. The probability that they, another random student, make an A on their chemistry exam is 10%. What is the probability that you make an A on your stats exam and they make an A on their chemistry exam? It would be 6%. And nice job typing it out in chat. Type out all this right here. <laughs> so much fun. What is your... <laughs> Good question. So any questions about this? Chance that someone makes an A with UT Chemistry M0? I tried to make it a lot lower and I tried to give you guys some hope here on that. Great questions. Does that make it a little clearer? And if you notice what these first few questions tried to do, they tried to illustrate the difference between the word independent and the word what? Disjoint. Disjoint is when one event happens, the other event what? Cannot happen. Cannot happen. Independent is when one event happens, the other event, how much information do you have with it when they're independent? No information. The exam is Thursday night. But what is the trick? We, uh, we will not give you dependent. So, but what if there was a trick question with dependent events instead of independent? We don't usually throw that trick question. Usually we ask you things like, why can you multiply these things together? Why can you add them? If we have two things and we ask you, why can you multiply them together? Why can you multiply them? Because the two events are what of each other? Independent. If we have two things and you can add them, why can you add them together? Disjoint. Write down these three things. And I'll take the question right here. Write down these three things. You ready? Okay, go ahead. You can, if they are dependent, you cannot use the multiplication rule. If they are dependent, you cannot use, you might be able to use the addition rule. You would need to show that they're what to use the addition rule. Disjoint. And disjoint events are dependent. 
But uh, it's tough because there's a lot to say right there, right? Yeah. Disjoint events being dependent means the following. If you know you made an A, you know you didn't make a B. So in other words, does knowing you made an A give you information about making a B? Thus, those events are what of each other? Dependent. And disjoint about those events means since you made an A, you definitely what? Did not make a B. You did not make a B. Question in class. And put those questions in chat. So a question where you would add the events would be like the following. And I'll take the two questions next. This is an example of adding the Patriots. We'll just keep using them. Have a probability of winning a game of 78%. So go ahead and write this down. Probability of winning is 78%. The probability of losing, we don't use to talk about that much, is 20%. The probability of what else, because it is football in the modern day, a probability of a what? A tie is 2%. So this, these are the probabilities, and they are in the chat right now for people to see. What is the probability that the Patriots win or tie? What is the probability that the people win or tie? It is 80%. And why can we add those events together? Because of the addition rule. Does that make sense? We can add these together because of the addition rule. And we can, we can use the addition rule because can you win a game and tie a game at the same time? No. And we've just told someone that these events are what of each other? Disjoint. And I am a teacher. I think I am. Hopefully. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Exactly. So listen key to what was just said in class, that what we have right here is that we have, if we are using the addition rule, we check to see if the events are what of each other. Disjoint, and then we can add them. Do everyone hear the three things? Addition rule, disjoint, add them. We can use the multiplication rule if things are independent, and then we multiply them together. And we use the word and. I want to illustrate right here that when we do the multiplication rule, the, what we will do is we will use the word and, and then we have the rule independent. Make sure to have this down some form for it right here. Multiplication uses the word and, and then they have to be independent of each other. We have right here that the addition rule uses the word or, and they must be what of each other? Disjoint. Be very, very careful. So right here, we have these rules right here as follows. So addition uses the word or. The events must be disjoint of each other. How do we check? Do, do it again. How do we check if they're disjoint? If this one happens, the other one can't happen. Instantaneously like that. How do we check in our minds? Because we can't do it the other way. How do we check with the independent rule? If one of the events happens... If one of the events happens, it gives us no information when we do the independent. Does everyone hear that? When you check independent, if one event happens, it does not give you information. So just pretend it happened. Well, let's see. The Patriots won. Does that give you information about them losing or tying? It does. So those events are very what? They are disjoint and they are dependent. Great job. Does this help make it a little more sense? Exactly. Sydney, you are correct. Great job. So keep it up. Are, are people understanding these concepts a little bit better now? And that's the point of the Kahoot. So we'll see who wins, but the biggest thing here is to understand all the topics and take notes. Let's keep going with the review. 134. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Let's see here. Witty Rooster and Bronze Elk is in the lead. Anyone in class with those? To multiply the probability of A and B, the two events must be what? You guys should just destroy this one. To multiply the probability, those two events must be what? This is a review question now. I want to see near 100%, don't break my heart, because what we have here is the multiplication rule. When you do the multiplication rule, you use and between them. You will say, what is the probability of this and this? What is the probability of this and this? And when I say and, you will do what with them? Multiply them, and they must be independent. I think that's a good, strong showing right there with the independent. I can already see the results. So we have here, great job. I think that's a good, strong showing. To multiply two events together, they must be independent, and then we can use the word end between them and multiply. So great job, everyone there. 
please ask the questions in chat if you're stumped at any point, and I'll answer all of them or ask them in class. All questions will be answered as best we can. We got Witty Rooster still in the lead. Is Witty Rooster in here? No? Oh! <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right, here we go. Let's see who's going to win. Anyone else get caught up earlier answering that one? No! Sorry. Um, the video delay is at 10 seconds right now, I think. Sorry about that, the other L word. Um, here, we'll continue on. Read the following as a sentence. So this is another great review question right now. You have to read what is, I got to try to not read it, probability A plus probability B times probability C. So now this is a review of the wording we use. And it looks like there's a nine second delay on us right now. I can see both screens. Sorry about the delay. So if you notice here, it's probability of A plus probability of B times probability of C. Do you remember those words I was using just a second ago? Think, when we add things together, what word do we use with addition? With addition, we use the word or, and with multiplication, we use the word and. So what we should see here is the probability of A or B and C. Does that make sense? And we won't ask you, this is not how we're going to ask you a test question, but this is just how we read it. And when you read things added together, think the addition rule. When you read things multiplied together, think the think and when you see and right there. My thing is acting up. I didn't even get to answer. No. Is anyone else not able to answer? Everyone else doing all right in the online chat? Sixth place hurts. You're so close. So close. We're going to jump away from probability here soon, but we are doing just fine. Let's continue on. So I hope. Are you guys? No. I think there's, oh, it's too quick. I'm sorry, it's too quick. I should lengthen this on the third one. I'll have them longer. There are longer ones in here, so we will continue on. Is it just a time thing? I'm sorry, we will, I will extend the times. I can't do it right now. I'm um, sorry. It's just, is it, is it time or wouldn't let you answer? Uh, no, I need to, I think it's, usually I have like a four second delay. I don't know why here at UT, it's too slow. Oh, well, we had we had uh, 67, 72 answers. Oh, no. Okay. We'll keep learning. We'll keep moving on. Okay. Next question. Witty Rooster still in the lead with the first to break 5,000. The probability of a gross jelly bean, which I'll probably bring next class, is 25%. If you eat three jelly beans, what's the probability they're all good? And we have 120 seconds for this one. We should get in all of these responses. Now, be very, very careful on this one. What you have to imagine here with this is you got some of those, you ever see those Harry Potter jelly beans? Like there's like spoiled milk, booger, lawn. I don't mind the grass clipping one or the toothpaste one. We all, I mean, I don't eat toothpaste, but I've tasted toothpaste. I'm sure everyone's tasted grass, but there's really, really bad ones. So with this right here, let's take a look and I'm going to move the face cam real quick. We're just going to move face cam. I don't think there's a really safe place to put it. I can put it right down here on this question right here. Cool. So it's going to block just that little bit. I hope it doesn't block much. But let's talk about how to solve this question right here. So with this question right here, imagine you're eating the jelly beans. You eat the jelly beans, and what about the first one? The first one is what? The first one is good. Tell me about the second one. But put a word between the first was good, and the second was good. And the third was good. Now, do you think that first jelly bean cares about that second jelly bean or that third jelly bean cares about that second? What am I telling you by saying those jelly beans don't care what they are? They're independent. They're independent. Meaning we can do what with all these probabilities? We can multiply. So what's the probability that first jelly bean is good? Now, be careful. What's the probability that first jelly bean is good? What's the probability it's good? 0.75. And then the second one's good, and then the third one's good, and so we get the mathematical probability right here, and feel free to type these in the chat, 0.75 times 0.75 times 0.75, and we see this right here, we should get the answer right there, which if you haven't gotten the answer, that should be the answer right there. Now I want us to, we are still looking at the question, so if you didn't answer, you should have it, and pretty good job on this question. But remember, this is being recorded, and there won't be a lag when you watch it when it's recorded. So if you're wondering how we did this, 
we had to talk about this question the following way. We want to see that you eat all good jelly beans. So if I were to write down this question, I would write down good and good and good and good. I might have said too many goods. But I'd write down good and good and good. Now since I'm using the end word, I'm using A-N-D, what would we do when we change it to mathematics? I'm going to take those ands and change them to not pluses, multiplying. So you answer by clicking on the answer in the video on the right. Uh, no, you need to be on your phone right now. You need to be on your phone. Now, here's the question. So Ethan brings up a really great thing right here, because we have the and and the or word. We have those words. Now, when you hear and, 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 you think what mathematically? Multiply. And I like, Blair said in here, good race to the third power. That's exactly what it is. Now, I want us to think, because someone said in the chat, great question, I thought you had to subtract from 1. And we do that in a lot of these. What would be if we took this probability we have and subtracted it from 1? So what would be in the chat 1 minus, 1 minus this right here? Because either they're all good or at least 1 is bad. Does that make sense? So the probability I've written in the chat right now, 1 minus 0.04218, if we solve that, that's the probability that at least one of your jelly beans is gross. Because think about it, you eat three jelly beans, they're either all good, or at least one is bad. And are those disjoint events? Can they be all good and at least one is bad? Those are disjoint events. And that's why we can add them together, which is what you're basically doing by subtracting. Now, I see some really great stuff in the chat. Try this example problem. What is the probability that all the jelly beans are gross? What is the probability that they're all gross? And great job answering in the chat. What is the probability that they're all gross? They might say in the class before chat can do it, but it shouldn't be too hard to figure out the probability they're all gross. And is that, and how did you find that mathematically? And they're saying it in class, and I think, yes, they're solving it, and there is the math, which equals to 1.6. And wouldn't that be weird if you got those Harry Potter jelly beans, and they told you that only 25% of the jelly beans are gross, and then you ate three gross ones in a row? That would be horrible. I hate you. Oh, so bad. The first would be gross, and the second would be gross, and, and why can I multiply these? How do I check the independent rule in my head? The jelly beans don't care, telling me that each of these jelly beans, gross or goodness, is one of each other. Independent. You see how we're using these rules right here. Now, what is, in words, 1 minus 0.25 to the third power? Well, they might, oh, they've already answered it in the chat. You knew I would go there. This, the compliment right here, it's already answered in chat, would be at least one is good. Because either they're all gross, or at least one is good. Does everyone see that right there? So be careful. Whenever we say they're either all this, the complement that of that is at least one is the other thing. So think about this. If we were to say to you, you buy scratch-off tickets. Let's do one last problem in this, because I want to make sure you guys have this down. <laughs> Let's try the scratch-off ticket question. I'm going to see a bunch of people answer in the chat here. So the probability of winning a scratch-off ticket is only... 20%. So the probability scratch off win, I'll do SW right here, scratch off win equals 20%. The probability of a scratch off win is 20%. You buy five scratch off tickets. What's the probability you win on at least one? Try working this right now on your sheet of paper, and then I'll explain how the problem is solved. It's a two step problem, though. It's using the complement rule because listen to what I said. The probability of winning a scratch off ticket is 20%. What is the probability you win on at least one with buying five? So you buy five scratch-off tickets, right? Now, if you win at least once, and we might already have the answer, nice job in the chat, it might be the answer, we'll take a look here. So I want us to think what would happen. You'll either, like what would be the bad thing with all the scratch-off tickets? You'll lose them all. So let's put here, lose, 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 lose. So we have here that you lose five times. What is the probability of losing on a scratch-off ticket? Probability of scratch-off ticket lose is 
What's the probability of losing on a scratch-off ticket? 0.8. Does that make sense? So what's the probability of losing and losing and losing and losing and losing? 0.8 to the fifth power. And what we've just found right here with 0.8 to the fifth power is not the probability you win at least one time. Read it. 0.8 is the probability you lose all the time. Five times are raising it to the fifth power. And you will either lose all five times or win at least once. So they've already been saying it and solving it in the chat. The probability would be 1 minus 0.08 to the fifth power. Nice job, chat. If you're getting it, who here feels that they understand these examples a little bit better now? Maybe you could work on these compliment questions. A little bit better. We like that. Keep working it and try these examples. Maybe come up with your own question. You say, the probability that I burn a batch of cupcakes, cupcakes just sound good right now, is 10%. I'm usually a good baker. So what is the probability that at least one of my batches of cupcakes is burnt? So probability of burnt cupcakes is 10%. Got it down. I like hearing that. So what is the probability at least one is burnt out of how many batches did I say? I didn't say how many batches, did I? We're going to make 10 batches of cupcakes. So we have to think about this right here. Let's go in, and I'll solve this one for you guys, because either all the batches will come out good. So that right there, 0.9 to the, ninth, 0.9 to the 10th power is the first batch is good, the second, or at least not burnt, right? The first batch is not burnt, the second batch is not burnt, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, and the ninth, and the tenth. And we would have to assume that all these batches are what of each other? Independent. Now, we could argue this. We could say maybe your stove has a problem. Maybe Brian's like falling asleep after making so many cupcakes. But for this problem, we'll assume that each batch of cupcakes I make is independent of the last. Just a problem assumption. So right here, sorry guys, no, they're getting kicked. So... Once you leave, I don't think you can. I'm so sorry. So right here, we have 1 minus 0.9 to the 10th power. If you notice, the Kahoot's just the background fun. The main thing we're focusing in on is solving these problems. Does that make sense? We should know how to do a, a complement problem pretty quickly. Did you guys, were you able to solve this cupcake problem as I was talking about it? Is that some yeses? Question in class, and let's keep those questions going online. Question. So the question is, if it's 1 minus 0 0.10, 1 minus 0 0.10 to the 10th power, let's read this in words. 0.10 to the 10th power. What is 0.10? That is the probability of a burnt cupcake, right? Or burnt batch. So 0.10 to the 10th power is all the batches are burnt. All 10 batches are burnt. So either they'll all be burnt, either all 10 will be burnt, or at least one is not burnt. So this right here, 1 minus 0.10 to the 10th power is the probability that at least one is not burnt. Because either all 10 will be burnt, or at least one will not be burnt. Do you see how we can talk about this? Focus in on this 0.10 to the 10th power, which is that 0.10 to the 10th power is all 10 batches are burnt. And either all 10 batches are burnt, and if we do the complement, we can find, or at least one is not burnt. Does that make sense right there? Yes, yes, yes. Good deal. We will figure out this whole Kahoot thing online. I think it's UT is a tiny bit slower internet. So the one subtract shows you the what? Great question, Wes. Wes asks, what is the one subtract doing? That is the complement. So I want us to practice saying the complement. When we say the complement, we could say something like, either everybody gets A's, or at least one person does not get an A. Either everybody in this room is drinking a soda, or not nobody, at least one person is not drinking a soda. Do you see how we can do the complement? So if you say, well, we have five people, either all five people are wearing a hat, or at least one person is not wearing a hat. Does that make sense when we say the complement in words like that? So, Just go ahead, question in class. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, Tim, you sure. Have 10 burnt, or you have 10 burnt batches or one is not burnt. That's but no, wait, remember, it's not that one is not burnt, one at least one, one is not burnt. At least one is not burnt. At least one is not burnt. That would mean, if we're going to go with it, it's just the number of just one. Correct. I mean, there's 9 out of 10 burnt batches. 
it's pretty bad, right? Uh, and I had up there, it was like 0.9. So this so right here... The same way for like, you know, if you had six patches, mm -hmm. each of one would be five out of six, and it'd be like... Four well, four. well, remember, what this mathematics is solving, so I'm going to put um, the, a note right here. Note, at least one is not burnt. That doesn't mean one is not burnt. That means at least one. Could all With this math right here, would it also be that all 10 might not be burnt? Because remember, it says at least one is not burnt. Now, there are deeper mathematics we get into when we do like uh, combinations and stuff. So we can actually solve harder questions, but we won't do that on this test, luckily, right? So do not worry. This class is not a whole class in probability. When you do the complement right here, if you were to say something like we baked five batches of cupcakes, either all five will be burnt or at least, at least what? At least one is not burnt. And you can do the opposite right here. I'm going to write another probability. Try reading this with my cupcake example. And great job online. Let's see if there's any other questions. This is my cupcake example right here. Tell me what, in words what this means. First, break down this first part, the 0.9 to the third power. 0.9 to the third power is three batches where all of them are what? 0.9, not burnt. They're good. You could say all three batches are good. So this right here, the 0.9 to the third power, is all three batches are good. One minus that is at least one is burnt. Does that make sense how we can just flip it right there? Really good practice on these ones right here. I hope this really helps. Uh, there will be some conceptual and some mathematics, and we'll focus on that. Um, chapter 13 is pretty algebra-based. Michael, you are correct. Great questions. You guys ready for another one right here? Let's continue on. Woody Rooster still in the lead. Which of the following is a rule of probability? This is a trick question. Oh, no, wait. Which of the following is a rule of probability? Which of the following is a rule of probability? It is not my famous saying. It is not my famous saying. Which of the following is a rule of probability? It is not the famous saying. Rules of probability are the following. I'm not going to say the one. All the probabilities must add up to what? All probabilities must add up to 1. Also, we have the complement rule, the addition rule. And the, is someone trying to get in? And the subtraction rule. So the complement rule, nice job. I think this one's a pretty easy one. Also, all probabilities are between what and what? 0 and 1. So if we ask you the probability of something on the test, and that's why I put this question in here, if we ask you the probability and you answer the probability is like 800, did it say what is the most famous thing? What is, oh, what is the famous saying? Q, Q, straight enough. No outliers. No outliers. Those are the conditions. Plot does, not plot does not thicken. That is the conditions for regression. Q, Q, straight enough. No outliers. Plot doesn't thicken. So the only one here that relates to probabilities is the following. We're probably going to switch topics here in just a second. Nice job, Muhammad, in the chat. Oh, no! Woody Rooster. No, Woody Rooster, no. Which of the following is not a rule of probability? I thought we just did this one right here. Oh, this is the trick one. Which of the following is not a rule of probability? Now, be careful. I just named them all. And one of these is not a rule of probability. Sorry, I should have made 60 seconds for all of these. I know this is kind of short. But with this, you heard me talk about the multiplication rule, the addition rule. We just saw that the probabilities are between 0 and 1. And I also said the set of all probabilities adds up to 1. So the only one that is not a rule of probability is the subtraction rule. I know that sounds a lot like the complement. We can take the complement, but it's not called the subtraction rule. Um, we have the multiplication rule, the addition rule, and probabilities are contained between 0 and 1, and the set of all probabilities adds up to 1. And you notice earlier, when I did the Patriots problem, did I, what did all those probabilities add up to? They added up to 1. So that's great right there. Got to dry, write and draw four places. No! Who is going to win the lead? Because remember, if you win, you get a $10 Starbucks gift card. Second and third get the $5.00. And we'll make sure we have at least one online winner. At least one online winner. Because I do think class might have an unfair advantage. So there'll be at least one online winner for the Starbucks gift cards. Going on to the next question. We're going to get to some new material here. Yes. Now we're on to some fun stuff. 
a research researcher decides to take five mile segments of roads and samples each mile segment. I'm gonna give some big hints right here. They're taking a whole bunch at once. They're also assuming that all of these are basically the same and they're gonna sample every mile segment within here. So they're taking a whole bunch at once. And watch out, look at the timer on yours, the timer on mine is different online. But when I'm saying they're taking a whole bunch at once, they're taking a whole bunch, I'm definitely talking about cluster sampling. So let's focus in on what cluster sampling is. Are you guys ready for more examples? By the end of this, I want you to be able to tell me a cluster sample. So let's try this with donuts. We're going to talk about food all tonight. So when we think about what a cluster of donuts is, what is a cluster of donuts? A dozen donuts. What is a cluster of Coca-Cola? A 12-pack of Coca-Cola. What is a cluster of students? A classroom. Now here's the thing, and we'll definitely talk about that one. Cam, I might skip that question for now, because you'll hear me differentiate between those two, and I might, I might go into that, but Cam, great question. When you take a cluster, write down these steps. Are you ready? One, clusters are random assignments of individuals or items into groups. So any box of donuts is kind of like any other box, right? Am I really talking about differences when I say a box of donuts? This is just, just a bunch of donuts. A cluster is just a bunch. So when you say I take a six pack of Coca-Cola, is that basically like any other six pack at our factory? It hopefully is, question in class. So the, the first thing, when we take a cluster, our clusters are randomly assigned into groups together. There should be kind of theoretically no difference between them. So step one, clusters are randomly put into groups. So, or items are randomly put into clusters. Oh, the pin's long gone goofy, no. Step two, and this is where it gets a little confusing and you might think it's multi-stage, Step two is to take random, let's hide that right there. Step two, do not, put the t do not put the pin in the chat. Step two is to, step two is to randomly pick clusters. Step one is to randomly assign the individuals or items into clusters, or they have been randomly assigned. Does that make sense? Do you think donuts are pretty much randomly put into boxes? Or like, oh, let's put all the bad donuts into this box. I don't know. I think there might be some confusion, but maybe, maybe not. Do you think Coca-Cola says, let's put all the bad dented Coke cans into a six pack? You can definitely watch it, Goofy Productions, and we will answer your questions if you got stat ones. So we probably don't put all the bad ones into it because we could probably say any six pack is like any other six pack. Does that meet our idea of clusters? Do you think if we randomly pick five mile road segments, we could just take a random five mile segment here, a random five mile section here, and we could just take random five mile road segments? <laughs> yeah. And then that meets step one. Step two is to randomly select the clusters. Step three, and good to have you, Ghost Train. Step three is that we do a what on the cluster. It's actually in the question. Step three is to do a not, you take the cluster and you're going to take a whole bunch of random clusters. Step three is to do a census on the cluster. Step one, things or items are randomly put into clusters. Step two, we randomly select those clusters. Step three, we do a census on the cluster. We're doing a review right here, right now. Yep. So does that help you guys understand this? So think about this, could we go to random classrooms around UT? I mean, that's, we could assume students are randomly in classrooms and pick random classrooms off the list. Maybe we wanna ask them their opinion about, should we have an In-N-Out burger on campus? Should we? I mean, we got, we got we, In-N-Out, let's get it, let's make it happen, get some In-N-Out burger. So with this in mind, the classrooms would be the what? The cluster. So the classroom would be the cluster and we would take random classrooms, and then we would do what to that classroom? Do a what on it? Perform a census, which means we sample everybody. Always glad to have everybody in here. Definitely free to ask questions, and I'll answer all those stat ones. So does that help you guys better understand how to do a cluster sample? We will talk about stratified here, maybe with the next question. 
Let's continue on. Gentle Hawk leading the way. A researcher selects their sample based on percentage of highway, country, and city roads. And I have a sneaking suspicion this question might be. Let's think about it. Here's a hint for those who have remembered some of the notes. It sounds to me like they're acknowledging a difference between different types of roads. So there's a big hint for this right here, and you're more than welcome to ask those questions with stats. So remember, we have right here, you would never have to list the steps. It's just to kind of make sure we know what's going on. Now remember, this researcher is saying, I'm going to select this amount of country roads, this amount of highway roads, this amount of city roads, based on what they see like in Knoxville. So with this in mind, it looks like so many people got it, and maybe because it's because I gave it away. This is stratified. And the key to stratified sampling is the following. You must do what? Identify or acknowledge a difference. So great job. And ask those questions online if you got them. You must acknowledge a difference. So step one in stratified sampling is the following. Acknowledge a difference in your population. What is the difference between donuts at Krispy Kreme? Say what? Flavors. Flavors. We've got uh, fruit flavored ones. We've got like savory ones like chocolate, vanilla, all that good stuff. What other, what other differences are there? Shapes. We've got like bear claws and we've got just the circular ones. We've got the donut holes. Those are differences. How about with Coca-Cola? What are ways you could stratify Coca-Cola? Sizes. You could take certain amounts of two liters at your factory or cans. Do you see how we're acknowledging a difference here? We're saying, let's take a sample at our factory. Well, we make cans, we make two liters, we make, uh, I don't know what else, we make the flavoring thing that you put in those machines. I just want to get one of those and just take the Coca-Cola flavoring when I need it. A little addicted. But with that in mind, try not to cringe. So with that in mind, how could we stratify students? Think of what you must do to stratify. So year, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, does that acknowledge a difference between students? It does acknowledge a difference. What else could we do to acknowledge a difference between students? In state or out of state? Do you see every time you say this, you're stratifying. So imagine someone took a sample of UT students and they asked them, do you think tuition is too high? And they talked to 100 out of state students. Do you think that'd be a good sample? Do you guys have something against out of state students? They might have a different opinion. So we acknowledge a difference between students and we say, okay, we want to take 70% uh, in state because 70% of UT is in-state, we'll just, I don't know the exact number, and we take 30% out of state. And by doing this, we have what our sample? We have done a what kind of sampling? We have done a stratified. Step one in stratified is to acknowledge a difference. Step two is to take a what within those groups. Step one, acknowledge a difference, put them into groups, and then step two is to take a what within those groups? Take a sample within those groups. Does that make sense? Now here's the biggest thing why stratifying and cluster are different. When you get a cluster, you sample that whole cluster. Does that make sense? When I say we acknowledge the difference between in-state and out-of-state, am I going to talk to every in-state student, every out-of-state student? No. So with that in mind, I'm acknowledging a difference and then sampling according to that difference and making sure I only get a certain amount to represent because we want all of our samples to be representative. So the key here, when you look at cluster and stratified, make sure you know that clustering takes a whole cluster and does a census on it. It randomly selects a whole cluster or multiple clusters and does censuses on them. When you do stratified, we acknowledge a difference like year at school or anything like that and then we sample in accordance to this. Do not post it. We could have people try to crash us. We've had it in the past. So, question on question class. Go ahead. No, it, it said we sampled all one mile segments. So imagine we go out and we say, imagine we want to like have our crew go out and we're going to see if there's potholes, which is kind of the theme of what we're going to do with this sampling portion. So if we go out and we say, let's uh, look at the Knoxville roads, but it's going to be really hard to say, let's see how many potholes there are per mile, but uh, we drive to this one mile segment, this one mile segment, this one mile segment. That's kind of tough, right? We're going to do clusters of five mile segments. And the five mile segments are now the clusters. Oh wait, so stratified berries, you know that blueberries in one group and pink. Yes, so that'd be stratifying. You are acknowledging a difference, Noble. 
great answer right there. Noble has figured out what stratifying is, but what would be a cluster of berries? The bunch. Like if you bought a, like a basket of berries, is that a cluster? Yeah, and maybe if you went out to a farm and you wanted to see how good their berries are, couldn't you go and maybe take different baskets of berries and sample them to see if they're ripe, if they've got blemishes on them, or how they taste? Would that be a good way to do it? Maybe get five baskets of berries at random from what they're selling? But what if the farm said to you, you only tried our blueberries, you never tried our blackberries? Maybe you should include a bit of what in your sampling? You should include blackberries, and how could we do that? By including some stratification. So now maybe you take three baskets of blueberries and two baskets of blackberries, right? So you've done what two types of sampling there? Stratified and clustering. The baskets are the clusters. Acknowledging the difference between blueberries and blackberries is the stratifying. How would you pick the baskets you take? Would you take the first five closest to you on the shelf? Your clusters are chosen at random. And since you're doing a cluster sample, how many berries do you, of course, sample in that basket? All of them. Where's the white berries? Oh, I never had those. So we, we strawberries, all of them. Aren't strawberries like not even berries? There's like, I think a banana is a berry. I'm not even joking. Am I right? A banana is a berry. This is... <laughs> So we will continue on. Let's do this right here. Next question. A researcher selects the first 20 roads next to their house. What kind of sampling is that? It doesn't sound good to me. They select the first 20 roads. Those who are kind of lurking in the chat, I want to see if you get the answer right. The first 20 roads. What does that sound like to you? I bet Noble, I bet you got this. That sounds pretty easy to me to select the first 20 roads. Sounds pretty easy. Sounds very, very what? Uh, they're saying it in class. <laughs> you can tell nobody, you can tell everyone you learn bananas are berries. Weird, right. Now we're on 12 second lag. I'm very sorry for the lag. I'm going to try to figure out some way to do this more instantaneously online. People in class can see. And I think everyone pretty, mo pretty much knows this one. This is not a random sampling method. Take notes. Convenient sampling is usually when you select the first ones. You can also put the survey online. Things like, we just put the survey online, which is in the notes. That is convenient. We'll talk about, I'm trying to think, the road ones, I don't think I have a voluntary bias on here, but voluntary bias is when people who volunteer to be sampled might differ in opinion than those who we would just randomly get. So polarizing questions often about things about politics, religion, questions like that, people who have a strong opinion might be more likely to respond. If we ask people, do you think UT is going to win the NCAA championship, and we came back and we said, 100% of UT students who responded said UT is going to win the NCAA. Why might it be? If we had a big NCAA banner out there, and we had you could shoot some hoops. Who wants to shoot some hoops right now? Yeah. So you, what do you think? UT going to win the national championship? Of course. I like that answer. Of course. Why do, you, why do you even ask, Brian? So this is our year. We got this. No Michigan State this year. So with that in mind, look at the history if you want. But what just happened when you came over to my ESPN tent where we're doing a poll of what UT students think about UT winning the national championship? What kind of bias might be in this survey? If we have a tent where we have ESPN talk about March Madness and we're on UT campus, we're asking, do you think UT will win the national championship? Maybe not response. Do you think those people are being more voluntary? Because... Now, like response bias goes into a lot of times when the question's worded, if you look at some of their homework questions, the homework questions have things like, do you think that it's fair that a 18 year old can go to war, can drive a car, can get married, can have kids, can have a job, can have a mortgage, and you can't drink a beer? Is that fair? What did I just elicit from you? A response bias. Response bias is when either the question itself or the person answering has bias in the response. <laughs> I'm glad you're liking it, Noble. Keep it up and ask those questions if you want to know more about stats. Maybe one day we'll see you here and you'll be like, I watched this four years ago. Now I want to do some stats. But response bias is when either the question... They said no, they're not. <laughs> response bias is when either the question elicits the bias or the person gives their own bias in the question. 
So response bias is when the bias is in the response. It's not accurately gauging. And I know sometimes, especially on my Pearson, it's a little confusing which one it is. But we try to make it as clear as possible on the test which one it is. And Michael, great answer right here. Voluntary bias, strong feelings linked to the item of response. Voting, um, voting is a little bit, and I think you mentioned that, voting is response bias because basically those with the strongest opinion, they vote. They vote. And that's why we often see massive differences in what people have. Um, response bias, question gives answeree the emotions to give the response they wanted, or it could be just the person gives bias in the response. Like maybe um, a lot of income questions might have response bias because people might inflate their income or might want people not to know their income. Like imagine you make uh, $8 million a year and you're answering some random survey with someone on campus and somehow you're some YouTube mogul, which is, you know what's really funny? Have you guys seen the channel Barack's Dubs where he sings songs? The guy who started that is a former UT student. So Fatty is his name. Do what? Look him up. Do what? Go Vols. And you can look him up. He did a Beacon interview. But like, imagine, imagine he made millions of dollars around off that. And then someone on campus walked up to him. And they're like, hey, we need you to do this quick survey. And he's like, yeah, you know, he's a nice guy. He's like, I'll do the survey. And it's asking all these personal questions. He's like, I don't know. So he puts down not the right response. What response would that, what bias would that be? It'd be response bias. What if somebody does not answer the questions? Non-response. And could you imagine like questions like with income or religion or other questions, people choosing not to answer because they have some sort of answer they don't want to give. Like they don't want you to know these answers and maybe you're getting what's called non-response bias. So we just went through a few types of Oh, he is so awesome. I met him so early on, and he is such a great guy, John. I, I love talking about him. His channel is awesome. Go subscribe. He's got like 1.2 million, and he's like so nice, such a cool guy. Go subscribe to Brock, Dub Brock Strub Dubs. Check it out after this right here. I'm like the smallest of YouTube channels promoting like a, a million plus, but he's a great guy. Non-response is taking survey and only getting 4% answers. Yes, great examples. Michael, I'm throwing you 1,000 points, Michael, right here. Let's continue on to the next question, Be writing these down. This is our review. Expert monkey, well, of course, expert monkey is winning. Why would they not be winning? A researcher selects every fifth road, and technically this should say they started at a random starting point. And I'll answer this right after this, the other L word. A researcher selects every fifth road from a random starting point, and I know there's limited time, but you should know the answer like that. The researcher selects every fifth road from a random starting point. I want you to say it in class so they hear it online. Systematic. systematic. You should know this instantaneously. Do not confuse the two S words because we have systematic and stratified. Systematic, and I'll repeat how to do it, and I'll answer the other L words question here online. I think Chelsea, thank you very much, might have had it. So and everyone, the chat's going really well with all the questions and all participation. So the way to do systematic is the following. One, pick a random starting point. Did everyone hear that? Now, we. I hope... We've forgotten that once in a while in the test, but I'm always like, it has to be a random starting point. That's the best way to do systematic. But every time I hear every fifth, every tenth, every twentieth, I think instantaneously. That's where you guys say the answer aloud. I think instantaneously. Systematic. Thank you guys. You hear you say systematic when you hear every fifth, every tenth, every twentieth. So it's like you've made a system. You're sitting there as the M&Ms go by, as we did in class, and you grab every fifth. Every fifth, like just like that, it'd be number five, number 10, number 15, number 20. And this is a form of random sampling. So when people didn't want to disclose that they were going to vote for Trump, that, so if they don't, so the other Elwood brings up a really good question here. If people did not respond to the pollster when they asked who they were voting for, what bias is that? If they did not respond to the pollster, that would be non-response. But let's say your spouse is in the room. And who are they going to vote for? John Smith. They're going to vote for John Smith. So you're like, I'll, I'm going to vote for John Smith too. You just elicited what, res what bias? Response bias because the bias was in your response. So if people, and also people could have said what to the pollsters? They could have said, I am. They could have said that. That would be response bias. And I was thinking they might say they are undecided or unsure. Basically undecided, unsure. Question in class. Under coverage bias, which I think we might have in this exam review, an un example of under coverage bias would be 
maybe if we called too many houses that identify as Democrat, or maybe too many houses that identify as Republican or Independent, we call too many or too few. There's a classic example where they did a poll on the phone of people on who they were going to vote for. I think it was in like 1924 or so. So they did this election poll on the phone, and they said, who are you going to vote for? Now, why might there be under coverage when doing an election poll on the phone in 1924? Only the wealthy have phones in 1924. So you've undercovered the non-wealthy. So under coverage is when you don't have the right amounts. And how can we fix under coverage? We could stratify. We could say, well, let's make sure our sample is 20% wealthy and 80% not wealthy. Like just hard to define, but we'd have to make sure we don't have too many wealthy or else we've undercovered the non-wealthy. So you can have multiple types of surveys, like if you choose every fifth cluster. Yes, you can. The blazing koala, which might even be their name in the game. This person right here brings up a great example that every fifth bag of M&M being chosen would be a what? We're going to start at a random starting point, and we're going to choose every fifth bag of M&M. Systematic cluster. And now let's say we're going to choose every fifth M&M off the line, but we're only going to choose 80% regular and 20% peanut. Systematic. I just said peanut and regular. Stratified. Systematic stratified. Let me see if there's other questions. So you've asked someone if they were a Democrat, Republican, and you said neither. If they are, if they are being truthful and saying neither, Noble brings up a great thing. If, you, if I asked you, are you a Democrat, Republican, and you say neither, and that's the truth, that's fine. But if you're not being honest, that would be response bias. Yeah. And people do that. They don't want to identify or maybe they just, they what don't. Did, you know. What did you mean about the kind of survey approach? Like whenever you were going for a survey, you're going for a survey, which only goes to respondents, then it would be something to coverage values? If, if that would be a comp, we have a comp, do okay. Good. That is complex right there. And I, the biggest thing with all of these survey things, you can take a whole class, and I bet he, even here at UT, just on surveys. Has anyone ever made a survey? Yeah. Is it tough? Yeah. Do you sit over like arguing every question? And oh, yeah. <laughs> so surveys are tough. Can you say the systematic stratified example again? Yes, I can. A systematic stratified example would be we go to the factory, and we're going to hang out at this uh, line where the M&Ms come down, and we're going to get every fifth regular M&M till we have 80% of our sample. And then I'm going to go over to the peanut line, and I'm going to get every fifth M&M starting at a random starting point, because systematic, every fifth M&M off the line until I get the remaining 20% of my sample. Start getting every fifth starting at a random starting point is where I'm telling you there is a what part of this? Systematic. And acknowledging the difference between peanut and regular is stratified. It's not cluster when I say peanut and regular, because if it were a cluster to some weird degree, I would take what of the peanuts and the regular? All of them. It doesn't make sense. Remember, when you take a cluster, you actually sample all of it. So when I talked about the cluster examplein just a second ago, I said I'd take what from my clusters of M&Ms? The clusters were the what's of M&Ms. The bags of M&Ms. Bags of M&Ms are clusters of M&Ms. Do you think the M&Ms are randomly put into bags, or do you think they smash up a bunch of M&Ms and then put them all into one bag? I would say they're probably pretty random. Good job. So is it only bias when you're lying? Lying would be a bias. Lying would be response bias. Great job, Noble, right there. You are correct. Lying would be an example of response bias. Or if the question pushes you to a response that is not your real response. Let's continue on right here. Expert monkey, wow. A researcher lists all roads and then randomizes the order and then selects the first 50. This is a tricky question we've done in the past. Now think about what we did right here. We randomized all the roads. So if we select the first 50 and they're randomized, like if I put you guys in a random order and I select the first five students, what would that be? If I randomize everyone in the class and I select the first five, that would definitely be symptom random. This is a trick question I've seen in the past. A lot of these questions that I built are modeled off trick questions or to build the, like your ideas behind it. This would be simple random. Good guess there, Noble. So I'm rooting for Noble. I wish he was in this. So with this in mind right here, simple random is what we would have right here. Simple random, and I'm going to explain it, and we'll take the question. The steps for simple random are this. Everything gets a random number, and then randomly select those numbers. 
So you could order the random numbers, right? If I give you all a random number, imagine I've got a big hat right here, and I have you select a random number out of the hat, and then maybe I say, people one through five get a prize. Would, would random people get a prize? <clears throat> but aren't I just taking the first five numbers? But how were those numbers selected? Randomly. Does that make sense? So what you do is you give everything in the population a number, and then you randomly select those numbers. You could randomly assign the numbers too, and then just take the first five because you've randomly assigned them. So if we give every road in Knoxville a random number, and then a random number, we have a simple random sample right here. Um, <laughs> there we go right there. Great job. I think question online in class, Mohammed. If you took the first 50 roads, that would be a convenient sample. And I, it was hard for me to write a voluntary one because the roads can't really volunteer. It's like, or imagine this. Imagine we are surveying roads in Knoxville and we're talking to um, the like Knoxville Commission Board and they, they give some roads for us to survey and look at to see. We're like some sort of national organization that tells like uh, the whole United States how good the roads in Knoxville are. And so the commission board says, oh, uh, go check out these roads. There would probably be some what? Voluntary bias. Because they're kind of volunteering those roads, right? So that, like we said, the ones that volunteer are different in the ways that don't volunteer. So good. I think refreshing the stream works. <clears throat> would bingo be a good example of a simple random sample? Uh, well, the numbers or the things we get, the bingo balls we get when we select, are from a simple random sample. You are correct. So that is just simple random sample. We're selecting from all the bingo balls randomly. What would be an example of a cluster of roads? Great job. Every, we would take five-mile road segments and sample every road. So check out that example earlier, Meredith, where we say we would take with the roads five-mile segments, and that's a what of roads, because we're going to sample each one-mile segment within. A five-mile segment is a... Cluster of roads. So that would be right there. So, and 25 each in a row, and you only test row the first row. Yes, oh, Noble, you are correct. If you are going to test um, cars and you only test the first row of cars, this will be posted afterwards too, Jillian, so you can go back and review these right here. Still confused on the bias with convenience sampling. Chrissy, the bias is convenience is when it's very easy to do, such as putting a survey on the internet or selecting the first 25 cars, as Noble said right there. But convenience is when you could say, well, if you just put the survey on the internet, your friends are probably going to do it. And you could say, maybe there's some voluntary, but it was really easy. Does that make sense? Like, oh, like this is not really a good way to get a good random sample. Or if I just asked you guys right now your opinions, is this a good random sample of students? It sounds more like a what sample of students for me to talk to you on your opinions. A convenient sample. Question in class, and we have some online. Question? Convenience sampling leads to convenience bias. So a convenience sample has in it convenience bias. So it's biased because the sample is not representative. Correct. Pretty much all biased samples are not representative. And true random samples are representative. So we'll continue on. We've gone a little slow through the questions, but we've been doing a lot of review. Expert monkey, and thank you guys for staying so long. We got the room until 8.30. So let's continue on. The researcher takes too many city roads in their sample. You guys should have this right like that. Oh my no. Too many city roads in their sample. And my screen is completely... Someone might have crashed us. Someone got a hold of the key eventually. Maybe Kahoot has a time limit on how long you can play it for. No? I've never had a Kahoot up that long. You've had a Kahoot up for three hours? <laughs> so let's log back into Kahoot. All right, here's the good news. If you won that Kahoot, please talk to me. But now we're going to log back into Kahoot right here. Yeah. We're going to have to put the pin in the chat, and we're going to see if people crash us, because all of a sudden now my computer is going absolutely bonkers. I'm sorry. This is the We've only had two Cahoots crashed. Colton, if you can send me a screen of that, or I'll honor it, Colton. Um, 
my cahoots here. Let's go down. I wish we could play the Mario one. You can see the Mario one right here. <laughs> John was in first. All right, we're going to try this. Please, nobody in the... We can do a backup where we can talk through the topics of this. Is How is the video quality right now for everyone? Is your video quality better than mine on this screen? It's still the same? I actually thought UT video quality would be a lot better with the upstream, but I think we need to use a hardwired connection. What I should do, and so we're going to go back to reviewing in just a second. Ah! All right, so I think we're just going to have to type in the chat. If they crash this this time, or if we crash for some reason, then we'll continue. But remember, this will be posted, so you can watch it later. And we're going to see what's going to happen here. So let's go to Classic. If they crash us, so be it. The game pin is, if they crash us, we'll just deal with it. That's fine. So go ahead. The game pin is 839133. So if we get crashed, we will just deal with it. But that's fine. 839133. We got people joining in. So, so don't crash us. Let's just wait another moment here. I'll most likely be skipping a lot of questions here. My computer is just like screaming away. What did they say? What time is the day? 770? Okay, we're going to give the Kahoot start another. Well, people can join in, right? Okay, so you probably won't be answering these questions here. And thank you if you're watching and not crashing us. That is much appreciated. Because, I mean, we can do it if we get crashed still. I'll just go in and not have anyone in. Okay, so let's go ahead and start talking about these questions. So we're going to do some of the harder stuff coming up here. These are the questions we've already done, and we're going to skip them. Skip question. Oh my gosh, did someone actually get that in? Please ask me questions while I go through this. I'm just going to talk to you guys. Let's talk about the, the test right here. Does everyone see the chapter we just did on, um, on uh, sampling? The que <laughs> nice job attempting to answer. The question we just did on sampling is a memorization chapter. The question we just did on sampling is a memorization chapter. I don't have decision trees in the Kahoot. And you know what I might try to do? I might try, you know what I might try to do? I might try to log online to the YouTube channel and tomorrow, <laughs> I like all the guessing. I might try to do a little decision tree interpretation on the YouTube channel. I'll try to get that in there. Yeah. Good job. So, oh no, look, everyone got their own. So decision trees are on the test. Now we have a link. So in the YouTube chat right now, can someone put the link to the lectures in the thing right there? Can someone put a link? So you can join Noble. Let's get Noble to win. So we, I'll feel great if Noble wins. Link to the playlist. I know it's so with this in mind here's the biggest thing you have to be able to read decision tree output I think the project is a really really good practice on reading decision tree output if you can read the decision tree output for the project you're probably pretty good for the test so does everyone hear that right there what is a good way to practice your decision tree interpretations Reading the output from decision trees. And that's basically what we have to test you on, right? Or the theory. Decision trees can take a blank variable or a blank variable. Decision trees take what two types of variables? Oh, wait. We're on a new question. Quantitative or categorical? So here we go. This question right here says, the list of all roads the researcher has access to sample. The list of all roads the researcher has access to sample would be the, the sample frame. Keep those questions coming and keep taking those notes and keep asking. Great job. So the list of all roads the researcher has access to sample is the sample frame. Take down this definition. Or let's try it right here. 
So we would start by saying, we want to understand UT students. By saying we want to understand UT students, then, <laughs> I like that right there, UT students would be the what for this? If we want to understand UT students, they would be the population. If we said uh, we have access to students who are, who are on campus students, that would be the sample frame. And the students we speak to would be our, and you see how we went down in size every time. You don't have to go down in size if you do a census. You could say, I'm interested in all people in the US. I have access to all people in the US. And I'm going to speak to all people. Now, you could argue that the census isn't even really a census, but you would, which we will argue. But so a census is you are interested in everything. You have access to everything. You sample everything. Make sure to do that line of questioning right there. Uh, we, I think we did skip it, Taylor. I'm very sorry, and I didn't see what it said. So sorry, Taylor. I was clicking away. But what is the parameter of interest? It would actually be the question we ask UT students. Does that make sense? So if we ask students, should we have an In-N-Out burger on campus? The answer is yes. And the parameter of interest would be the proportion of students who think we should have an In-N-Out burger on campus. What if we ask students, uh, how many games will we win in the NCAA tournament? The parameter of interest will be the number of games students think we'll win, or the average amount of games students think we'll win. I'm in first from guessing what we're skipping to. That's awesome. What is the code? I think we're good on this right here. So let's continue on. Let's continue on. The next question is the road that the researcher samples. And let's see. I think we got this one. The roads that they sample is definitely. They went out and took 120 roads or samples of roads. The roads, the roads they actually sample. I'm basically saying it. The roads they actually sample is the sample. These are the ones they actually get information on. Nice job. I feel like later on they're going to have a class on this and know it. So the roads they actually sample are is the sample. Does that make sense? Oh, no, I'm sorry you feel that way. But let's continue on to the next question right here. The next question says, the roads the researcher wants to understand. Be very careful on this one. I've seen a lot of people get this one wrong. The roads the researcher wants to understand. As in, they're going out and researching Knoxville roads. So they want to understand Knoxville roads. They want to understand Knoxville roads. It is the parameter of, wait, no, wait, what? No, 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 no. The roads they want to understand. Sorry, you caught me off guard. No, not parameter of interest. What? Why the you roads do they this? want to understand. Why did you do this to the population? I, no, well, think about this. Wait, just let's review. The researchers want to understand roads in Knoxville. That would be the what of their roads. The population of roads they want to understand. The population is, and write down this definition, the population is, all people or things we want to understand. The parameter of interest is what we want to understand about them. So listen carefully as we go back to the previous example. I want to understand what UT students think about us having an In-N-Out burger on campus. What would be the population? UT students. I want to understand UT students. What would be the parameter of interest? They're the proportion of students who think we should have an In-N-Out burger on campus. Does that make sense? So the parameter of interest is what we're asking them. The parameter of interest is the question we are asking. The population is all people or things we want to understand. Question in class. The question would be, and I think it's coming up, or maybe I skipped it. It would be, uh, which I'll be giving this away so you can answer it when you see it, uh, the amount of potholes per mile. Because that's what they want to understand. Does that make sense? The amount of potholes per mile is the the amount of potholes per mile is the parameter of interest. Does that make sense? Because that's what they want to understand. The people or things they want to understand is the population, but the question they want to understand is the parameter of interest. So you can words use words like the population of interest, the parameter of interest, and the population will have a parameter. So we would say there is an actual truth to the potholes per mile in Knoxville. We want to understand that. 
So we're going to look at roads in Knoxville, which will be, we want to understand all the roads in Knoxville, the population, and then the parameter of interest would be the potholes per mile. Sample frame, people you want to ask. Sample frame is people or things you have access to. So what if there are roads in Knoxville we cannot get to? We simply just cannot get to them. Would they be in our sample frame? They would not be in our sample frame. But are they in our population? Yes, because we want to understand roads in Knoxville. So sample frame is every person or thing you have access to. So if you can't access them, you would not be right there. So, exactly. Nothing was said. So, good job right there. Thank you, mods. Just make sure to do that right there. Thank you, mods. And let's continue on. So with this in mind right here, let's continue on. The researcher is collecting the average amount of potholes per mile. I know you guys got this one right here. The researchers are collecting the average amount of potholes per mile. What is this with the average amount of potholes per mile? You guys know this. What is it? So much silence. I did too. The average amount of potholes per mile is what they want to understand. Thus, it is the parameter of interest. Nice job. Thank you very much. And thank you, mods. If you notice, a lot of mods were on that. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's continue on right here. Amusing Lion, you are doing great. And ask those questions if you got them in the chat. The probability of making a shot is 0.3. What is the complement? And I know you guys got this. This is a nice and quick thing, but to Noble in our chat, our best visitor to date, Noble, to do the complement, all we do is this. If 0.3 is the event, the complement would be 1 minus. So in class, let's hear it. 0.6, what's the complement of 0.6? 0.4. 0.2, what's the complement of 0.2? All you do is figure out what adds up to 1. So we would say 0.3 plus what is 1? 0.7. Noble, did you get that one right here? So 0.3 and 0.7 add up to 1. Thank you very much, Michael. Nice answer in the chat. 0.3 plus 0.7 equals 1. And next time if we do this from campus, I'm going to use a hardwire connection. So thank you very much, Chelsea. Oh, no, you, well, you can answer those questions, and I appreciate it. Noble, you can answer them in the chat. So let's continue. I like that. We have Amusing Lion and Dr. Goose. Awesome of Glad Finch. Let's see. The law of averages is a fallacy. What is the truth? It says the one you can't see. If head occurs too much, tails is more likely. That is false. The law of averages is a fallacy. What does the law of averages, what is the law of large numbers, basically? That past events do not influence independent trials. That's what we talked about earlier, right? We talked about past events do not influence independent trials. And the law of, no, law of large numbers is the truth. The law of large numbers is the truth. The law of, law of averages is a fallacy that states, if I flip a coin and it comes up tails four times, the law of averages would state what? The coin is more likely to come up what? If the law of averages were true. More likely to be heads. If I keep getting tails, 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 then the coin will be more likely to be heads. But that coin does not care because each coin flip is what of the previous one? Independent. Can you figure out the probability right now of getting heads twice in a row? Put that in the chat as a review question. What is the probability of getting heads twice in a row? And you will have done a review question from way earlier on here. It is what? Correct, and you found that by doing 0.5 to the second power. That's the probability of getting heads twice in a row. What's the probability of getting at least one tails? What is it? Because you will either get all heads in two coin flips or at least one. So what's the probability of at least one tails in two coin flips? And I'll write it in the chat right here so people can see the mathematics. This is a review question. I love doing review questions. It'd be right here, and let's read this off mathematically to review. 
we have 1 minus 0.5 to the second power, which is the probability of getting heads twice in a row, because you get heads, and you get heads again on the coin flip, and then either you get all heads, or you get at least one tails. So 1 minus the probability of two heads in a row is at least one tails flip. Um, exactly. So, and actually, I'd love to do another. That's a great question. Let's see if you guys can do this problem. What is the probability with a coin flip of getting heads on the coin five times in a row? What is the probability of getting, type this in the chat, and remember, we're going to say you get heads on the coin, and you get heads, you flip and it goes heads again, and again, and again. What is the probability of five times in a row? This is a review question. And it looks like they've solved it, and it would be this right here. What's the probability of at least one tail? One minus this, because you'll either have all heads in five coin flips or at least one tails. So the complement right there. So good job, good practice. And you can see it's more likely that there'll be at least one tails, right? It's, it's unlikely to get five in a row. So great job. Good review question from way earlier on. I wouldn't study that every day, all day, but I hope you guys are pretty quick on those complement ones. Next question. So great job. We'll show that right there. Show that answer. I don't know why I did that answer. So we know UT is 20% freshmen. We sampled 200 students and 30 report being freshmen. What is P hat? I love this question. This came from lecture today. What is P hat? You should know it pretty quick, pretty instantaneously. When you encounter a question on the test, this is Brian's tips for test questions. With my tips for test questions, the following. Put notation for everything here. So put notation for everything here. What is P hat? And we're going to do a notation quiz in just a second. I'll look at the answers. And pretty good job. I tricked some of you. So, so if you said, what's the probability of getting head eight times in a row? You are exactly right, Noble. Great job. If you're in middle school, you are doing excellent at these probabilities right here. It would be 0. 0.5 to the eighth power is heads eight times in a row. So let's talk about what this notation is. Some people put 0. 0.20. What is 0. 0.20 in notation? It is 20%, and it says we know, and Cheyenne, great job. It says we know, we know UT is 20% freshman. If we know UT is 20% freshman, what is this? If this is true, if 20% is true, what is that in notation? P. That is the true proportion of UT that is freshman. Does that make sense? P would be 0 0.20 on this problem. Not many people answered 200, but what is 200 in this example? That'd be n. n is the sample size, so 200 is the sample size. What is 30 in this example? 30 would be x, which is how many successes there are. Does that make sense? So what do we do to find p hat? And they put it in the chat. Thank you so much, Cheyenne, for writing that again. We do x over n, which is 30 over 200, and we get p hat is 0.15. This p hat here in notation is the sample proportion. Does that make sense? The sample proportion. And thank you guys for staying so late. We'll probably be done in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you guys so much. Has been, it's been a long day for you guys? Woo, same here. Nice job, amusing line. We know UT is 20% freshman. We sample 200 and 30 report being freshman. What is N? We've got this. We'll destroy this question. We got this. What is N? We have this. Now, please. You'll notice in my videos, I start circling, only people in class can see this, but I start circling the numbers and I start writing next to them what they are. I circle my numbers and I write next to them what they are. 30 would be X, 200 would be N, and 20, because we know that that's what it is, we know that is the true proportion, that would be P. And then X over N would be P hat. Write down your notation, because as soon as you write down the notation, what might you do? If you get the notation correct, you might flip to the back of your test and look at the what. So this is, write down this tip for the test. I think it helps a lot of people. Write down the notation you read in the problem. If you see things like, the standard deviation for the waist size of males is 3.0. This is a quiz. Write it online right now. Thank you, Noble. Great job. If you were to see the standard deviation for the waist size of males is 3 inches then what would that be in notation? Who's got it in class or online? The standard deviation is three inches for waist size of males. That would be... 
So in notation, this is one of the ones from your homework. It talks about the waist size. It's the theoretical question. So it says that the standard deviation is about three. The standard deviation would be sigma. Because that is the true standard. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But what if it said the true mean, or it says the mean for the waist size of males is 34 inches? That would be mu. Be careful, it would be mu. So listen carefully how it's read. The standard deviation for the waist size of males is 3.04. It says something like that in your question. That is sigma. Standard deviation, sigma. And this is the true standard deviation. The mean is mu, mean mu. And so with this in mind, mu is the true standard deviation of the waist size of males. And it might say something in the question like, we know that the waist size of males has a mean of 34 and a standard deviation of 3. So I've just told you the true mean and the true standard deviation known as mu and sigma. And as soon as you see those in the test question, circle them, put what they are, and look to your formula sheet. Does that make sense? Then you'll put yourself on a path for that question to figure out what you might be solving. So even do that with your test questions. So good stuff right here. I know, no, but we went way more complicated with these ones right here. Sorry. <coughs> Let's talk about the next one. We know UT is 20% freshman. We sampled 230 report being freshmen. What is P? This is my notation quiz on this one. You guys should have this. Chrissy asks a great question. I'll answer it right after this one. So I'm going to talk about this one, Chrissy, and then I'll answer questions right away. Yes, on the crashed one counts, Mark. Send me your crashed win, and I will let you. You get a Starbucks gift card. Send me confirmation of your crashed win, and you get it. I'll take, as long as I don't have 10 people tell me they won, I'll take the word as long, or I'll take your best uh, thing to show me. I think we'll get this one right away. A few people were tricked. Remember, P. Write down notation right now. What is P? P, but what is it? You are correct. It is 20%. It is the true proportion. So if we know UT is 20% freshman, I'm telling you that's the truth. So there's a notation quiz right here. Um, yes, email me the screenshot. My email is bstevens at utk.edu. So there we go right there. Um, we will give you all the formulas you need. Mariah, great question. And uh, Chrissy had a question. With respect to the central limit theorem, when is a sample size of two appropriate to use? With respect to the central limit theorem, when is the sample size of two appropriate to use? So I'm going to jump topics here for just a second. Condition one. Uh, random. Random. Condition two. 10%. And condition three, what do we do before? Pause. And I think we have this as our last few questions on here. But when we use the central limit theorem with the large enough n condition is when we have quantitative data. Would we use it for these questions at all? Because we're asking if someone's a freshman. Asking if someone's a freshman is a what kind of question? Categorical. Categorical. So is it large enough or is it success failure? Success failure. It's success failure for the third condition. And I know you came in today and you were asking about it. Do you feel like you have the third condition down? Do you feel like you have that down? Yes. Because I know earlier today you are like, I don't know which is which. And now I think you've got it. I like hearing that. So we just do condition one, condition two, and then we pause and we ask, is it categorical or is it quantitative? These conditions we're talking about right here are what we use for sampling distributions to see if the sampling distributions will be what shape? Normal. And so we can use the normal or we can make confidence intervals for our next chapter, which we just did today. So those are the conditions. And so Chrissy asked, when can we use two? And the answer is, if the distribution's already normal, how large does n need to be for it to be normal? If it's already normal, it's fine. Because as n increases, the distribution becomes more normal. So if it's already normal, how large does n need to be? It doesn't need to be. But if it's skewed, n should be how large? 25. If it's heavily skewed, 100. And usually we like to use the words because we don't want to, my Pearson sometimes has you look at pictures, but all of that good stuff right there. Nice answers online. This one, I couldn't find the code. Awesome. Well, I'm ha I hope you're having some fun, Noble. Um, but there, yes, we do. I just don't know if there was a copy on Canvas we looked at before the test. The stream has about a nine-second delay. You're very right, Mark, and I don't know. Maybe one of these days I'll figure out how to make that delay not happen. 
I, but the main goal is we're learning, and I hope everyone still got 100 people in. I hope you guys are all learning. I think the internet that I'm using is slower today than last time. Nice job, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Another thousand points. Last two questions. Let's finish up and get going. We'll finish at about 8:30. And thank you guys so much for staying this whole time. Um, yeah, thank you very much. UT is 20% juniors, um, 80 students, 30 are juniors. Find the mean of the sampling distribution. Oh, I like this question a lot. This question is way easier than it sounds. UT is 20% juniors. We know UT is 20% juniors. I'm going to put the answer in the chat in notation. The answer is mu p hat equals mu p hat equals what? Mu p hat equals p. And great job, everyone who got it. Because if we know UT is 20% freshmen or juniors, if UT is 20% juniors and you went out and took a sample, what would you expect to see? 20%. So when you draw the David M. Lane normal curve, or just the normal curve, what would you put right at the center of that? 20%. And guess what we're probably going to do next? We know the mean, so I bet good money. Oh, sorry, I'll go back to one second. We're going to find the standard deviation. I'll explain in just one second, because the question's on the screen. I'll do it right after this one. So I'll do it right after We'll take the question right after this. So UT is 20% juniors from 80 students, 30 are juniors. What is the standard deviation? To find the standard deviation of this distribution, standard deviation of p hat, try working this problem out, it's going to be p times q over n square root. And I'm typing in the chat notation. Try working this. If you get this, you're on track. Let's first identify what p is in this problem. p is what? p is 0.2. What is q? 0.8. As soon as you know p, you know q. p is 0.2. q is 0.8. p times q, 0.16. That's p times q over n, which is how much? 80, and then take the whole thing and square root. P times Q over N square root. Great job. Oh, I think it's a question here first, then I'll go there, and then online. Go ahead, question. Mm -hmm. This is, yes, this one right here that we are doing is the curve that is with p at the center, and then it goes plus or minus each time, a p times q over n square root, and it's categorical, which I think the example we use in the notes is the question with the ghosts, where 45% of people believe in ghosts, and in a survey we see 48%. Awesome. But I have a question, what kind of word field would you get? Yeah, exactly. Business analytics and coding and all that good stuff. Great stuff. All I could say, there's a lot of coding business analytics. Yes, this is just an intro class. We cover, this class right here is to cover kind of the broad spectrum of what you might do in other disciplines. Hey, I like that. I have fun with it. Let's continue on. We're almost done here from the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. What is the third condition? Listen carefully. We are talking about the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. So what did we say right here? Great job, ladies and kids. Thank you guys very much. The sampling distribution of the sample proportion, what is that? What is the third condition? Condition one. Random. Condition two. Less than 10%. And condition three. Success failure because proportions are categorical. And make sure we got some test questions that review this. And if you're having fun tonight, hit that like button. I guess they say it counts if you hit the dislike button too. But if you want, hit that like button. It just helps out the channel. And if you guys notice, I don't have any ads on this channel. I'm not trying to make money from the channel. Hopefully, as long as YouTube never puts ads on my videos, which I've never monetized the channel, uh, you won't see ads on these videos. So if you want, hit that like button. And you can hit the subscribe. And you can unsubscribe if you leave UT. Or you can check in like a year or two from now and be like, hey, Brian's doing another Kahoot. <laughs> Let me see. Exactly. Put up that bell timer. We're almost done here. I think we have three more questions. I'll go a little bit quickly. But remember, I do have office hours tomorrow from noon to 5. So you can swing by office hours tomorrow from noon to 5. I'll review, be reviewing as much as I can. I do have an exam tomorrow night from 6.30 to 8.30. And then we got our exam the following night. 
And then I have an exam Thursday morning. Who else has three or four exams this week? I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain here. So let's continue on. Let's finish up and let's find some winners. Um, exactly. Oh, I don't have a trip stream. We'll find out more. We got some cool stuff to come here, Noble. Thank you so much for enjoying the class. For the sampling distribution of the sample mean, what is the third condition? Wait a minute. This says the sampling distribution of the sample mean. It's going to be a thing it wasn't last time. I don't want to make this clear. These are key words. Sampling distribution of sample mean, which means you're doing chapter 13. If in a question, this is a huge hint. Brian's tips for test again. Pro tip here. If you read in a question, it says sampling distribution of sample proportion. Sampling distribution of sample mean. You should go to your chapter 13 formulas at the end. Make sure you know which formulas. Look at the review test. Look at the one we posted and make sure you can identify these are the formulas for the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. These are the formulas for the sampling distribution of the sample mean. I'm from New York, so talk a little bit quickly at times. All this good stuff. Let's continue on. Last but not least, yes, a randomization question. I love these. What percent of the time did you get two heads? You ready for this? Yeah. We have here these number trials right here where you're sampling five numbers. And we might have to review this, so I'm getting a little bit tired too. It's been a long day. So do you see these numbers right here? Heads are numbers 0 through 4. Does everyone see the numbers 0 through 4? So I want you to imagine right now this sequence of five right here, five coin flips. How many heads flips were there right here? There were four. Heads, 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 and heads. I probably should hover right here. Heads, 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 and heads. Now right here, how many heads flips are there here? Two. Wait, that's one time. How many heads flips are there in this one? Three. And then how many heads flips are there in this one? And how many heads flips here? Five. So how many times, or what percent, did we get? One out of five, which is 20%. Oh, no. So you have to look at the numbers at the top and view them as coin flips. So go ahead and try writing this down with me right now. Turn these numbers right here at the top. Does everyone see the numbers I'm hovering over? Um, I'll hover it over here so you can see. Does everyone see these numbers right here? These numbers need to be turned into coin flips. So go ahead and write down that first sequence as coin flips. What would you write down? Heads, 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 tails, heads. So now write down the second sequence as coin flips. Tails, tails, heads, tails, heads. How many times did you get exactly two heads um, in that one? You got two. Like two, two times out of the five. So in the next one, you got it. So these are coin flips of five trials. It's a little bit tricky. Do you guys kind of understand now? I think this is a pretty good randomness question. Does this make sense on how to do this randomness question? Please ask questions. I'm just going to pause on this a little bit longer. The second group has two heads. Shouldn't it be 100%? Um, so the other L word, great question. How many, how many trials did we do here total? Five trials. Out of the five trials, how many times did we get two heads? One out of five. Does that make sense? So every time you get a simulation question, I would change the numbers into what they actually are. If I could write above this for the online people to see, I would write tails, 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 and it's too small. But you see, I would try to write as best I could. Or I could put red marks for tails, and I could put a blue mark for uh uh, red marks for heads and blue marks for tails. For those in class, they can see right here that I'm trying to put some sort of notation on this to where I can see that this right here is heads, 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 tails, heads. And I would definitely try to write it above it and keep track of what's going on. Now, this is a very short question. If I were to write this on the test, I'd write something like, you're interested to see what happens with coin flips. You sit down and flip a coin flip five times to see how many tails and heads you get. You repeat this flipping of five times, five times. Kind of sounds weird, right? But you do five total trials where you flip a coin five times. Do you see that with the numbers? And so you want to see in your simulate or your coin flips, which is a simulation of the coin flips, 
how many times in your trials you got, and I probably should have written, exactly two heads. There's a word limit to cahoots, and I was running out of the words here, so even exactly was too much. The main part of this was the simulation, and the main thing you should know for simulations is turning the numbers into actual things. Now, how can we make a simulation better? Run more trials to get a better estimate because that's basically the law of large numbers which will show us the more true probability. Michael, another thousand points. Michael has converted everything in the chat to their heads and tails coin flips. And I think it's right. I hope they're right. So thank you very much. Um, let's do the last question. Is it a fun one or is it serious? Let's find out. Amusing lion. Whoa. Are they in class? What percent of the time did you get two tails? So I want to see some great answers for this question right here. It's another simulation question. What percent of the time did you get two tails? Is this exactly two tails? Exactly two tails. Exactly. I think it's exactly, and I'm very sorry. I should have put exactly in there. You are correct. Because we're not saying you got three. We're not saying you got four. We're not saying you got five. Getting two tails is what to getting exactly three tails? Getting exactly two tails to getting exactly three tails are what events of each other? Disjoint, because if you get two, you can't get three. Review question. So if we look right here, we need to look for one of these or how many of these have no, wait. What do you see right here with this one? Two tails for the third one right there. And then what do you see for this one? Two tails on the next one, right? And I think Michael already has the cheat sheet in here. It looks like sequence three and sequence four. So what is the answer in that chat? Is what? I think, wait. How much percent? 40%. 40 percent. 40 percent. Nice job with those answers. I'll take a few more questions from everybody right here. Thank you guys so much. Who's our winner? So Amusing Lion destroyed it. Who is Amusing Lion? I thought it would have been so cool if it was Noble. Like Noble comes in, they're like a PhD in statistics and they just like get everything really quickly. Good. Never know. Prodigies exist. <laughs> Oh no, well, other L word, if you could send in your score. If we don't have a top three other L word, um, you can send it in, uh, send it to my email. And anyone else, can you explain what would make the margin of error large, smarter, and a, larger or smaller in a confidence interval? Madison, the margin of error in a confidence interval is controlled by three things. So the margin of error in a confidence interval is generally controlled by the percent confidence we are. If you are more confident, imagine you go from 80% to 90% to 95%. If I told you I'm 10% confident in my test score, I'd give you a big or small interval. Like I'm 10% confident my score will be in the interval. My interval would probably be pretty what? If I'm only 10% confident, my interval would probably be pretty small. But what if I was 99% confident? A wider interval. So we can change the Z statistic in our interval that changes the confidence level. So when you go from low levels of confidence to higher level of confidence, the interval gets wider. So we don't have it on this one, but the standard error of the interval, actually we do have it, the standard error will also make the interval wider. As I say in my other classes, the standard error is basically uncertainty. And thank you guys, and feel free to smash like, smash subscribe, do an old school YouTube here. So, <laughs> comment, like, subscribe, throw some comments on. See you guys, great job, thanks for coming. So, and thank you guys very much, and feel free to head out if you want. I'm definitely going to head out here in just a moment, I'm going to answer all the questions though. So we have here that if you increase the confidence level, the interval will get bigger. bigger. If you increase the standard error, the interval will get bigger. bigger because that's uncertainty. If you increase the sample size, the interval will get smaller because think it's P times Q over N. If N gets bigger, the standard error gets smaller. So take the notes if you want, and it is in the video, so if you want to review this later. The three things that control the margin of error of a confidence interval would be, one, your confidence level. More confident, wider interval. Two, your sample size. Larger sample, smaller margin of error. Because think, if you get a bigger sample, aren't you kind of more certain? Like, not, it doesn't change the confidence. It just means your interval's going to be tighter, right? Because you have more data. Don't break the 10% condition, though. And the last thing would be the standard error, which the sample size is a part of. Standard error is basically uncertainty. I'll call it that in BS320 if you guys take it with me. Standard error is that last part of the third part of the equation we talked about today in class. And standard error is times by your z-score. So if you're timesing two things together in your margin of error, if standard error is bigger, your margin of error is 
bigger. And so let's see other questions in the chat. I'll take the ones in here. Will the exam have many questions about chapter 13? It will have a few. Make sure to know the sampling distribution of the sample proportion, the sampling distribution of the sample mean, and also confidence intervals. These are very, very mathy chapters where when you read the question, mark the notation for each one. Put if this is n, if it's mu, if it's sigma, if it's p, if it's p hat. So do that right there. And let's see if there's other questions here. Uh, <laughs> Nice. Um, definitely look over that practice test. Uh, thank you, Michael, so much. Um, it, I, that was an estimate, Michael, about how many points I did. I said yeah, it was. Oh, it's sub to P. <laughs> cool. Sure. Um, but no, but you can watch the video again. This was super helpful. Thank you, Matthew. So glad to hear that. I got a zero in the chat, but 99, please don't count as A+. Plus. Um, we'll be we'll be able to list off of these questions posted somewhere. Uh, you can watch the video again. I might be able to send it to you. The <laughs> too funny. Okay, other questions in class. Go ahead and ask, and I'll I'll say them in the chat too. So this will be in the video, and I'll probably go. thank you guys so much. I'm glad you guys liked it, and I hope a lot of the questions were answered. And we'll keep going. Question. So uh, uh -huh. on the side it says the sample size does matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much of the population you have sampled. So it won't actually change the mathematics, and this is for the representative ones. So the size of the sample does not matter in how representative we are. It matters how we sample. Now, of course, you could say if we sample 10 people, that's not representative. But imagine if we get a random sample of 1,000 people from Knoxville, and we get a random sample of 1,000 people from the United States. By virtue of them both being random samples, all the statistics being created by the same sample size is going to do the same results in the same mathematics. Okay. But what really matters is how we get that sample. So it's in, in it right there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, just send me your name. What's your name again? Juliana, send it to me. You get something for third. You do. Great job. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Did you get second or first? No. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Great job on third place right there. Okay. Night Noble, see you. Does a bias sample frame lead to an A bias sample frame, yeah. A bias sample frame would probably have under coverage in it. When you think about it, like, you say, I'm going to go to the college Democrats to ask them who they're going to vote for. So who do you have access to? Unless you want to see, like, who's going to win the primary or something like that. If you're like, who's going to win a general election, your sample frame, the people you have access to, Unless you're wanting to understand Democrats, if you're like, aha, looks like uh, UT students are going to vote for the Democrat candidate. You're like, well, you, you spoke to, you undercovered people. And so there can be bias in how people sample, and the sample frame is the people you have access to. So the ones you pick from, because think not everyone's going to speak to you, so your sample frame would be the people at that meeting, which might not be everyone in the group, but theoretically anyone in the group would be at the meeting. And so that would be your sample frame. The people who spoke to you would be your sample. And that would be a biased sample with under coverage if you wanted to talk about all of UT. So, so if you have a question, send me the answer to the bias sample frame. Mm -hmm. Define the cluster sample. Define the cluster sample. Define cluster sampling? Okay. Yeah. Do you see that the cluster sample frame is usually more than You can, and we probably won't go into that much detail. Did someone write yeah, that up there? Yeah, it's it's uh-huh mm -hmm. and that's the key right there so you do see simple random samples so there's a key note that in the uh definition of cluster sample it does say simple random sample so things are put into clusters but how are you going to pick the clusters you sample uh, okay. randomly yeah, okay. so watch out this is not a multi-stage because how would you have to get your clusters? And once we do stratified, when we put things into strata or we acknowledge strata, how do we sample from the strata? By sampling from the strata, simple random sample within the strata. So you would simple random sample your clusters in cluster sampling. And within the strata, you take simple random samples within the strata. It's just you have to select within the strata somehow, and you must pick your clusters somehow. Now, you could pick every fifth cluster, which would be clustering with what in? Systematic. systematic and so and you would pick a random starting point for your clusters so all that great stuff there so go ahead question, under oh these are the ooh, these are the sampling ones okay wait to find the public's view on obesity researchers waited outside a fast food restaurant <laughs> you're crazy 
They had randomly selected from a list of such stable instruments. They stop every 15 person. And so go down to the question itself. Um, go down to the one all the way down to the bottom. Um, under coverage bias, since those interviewed just left a fast food place, their opinions on obesity. So they're basically, because we want to understand. Why it's not just on fast food. It could be. I don't love this question. So yeah, I, that's why. Yeah, and so you could say, we would try to make it more clear on the test. Mm -hmm. um, so you would say that we're under covering people who don't go to fast food places. That would be, you know, we have a bias there. Or you could say, um, a lot of times when they go for response bias on my peers, they usually go for things like, you're welcome very much, Andrew. Thank you guys so much. Um, and I hope this will be better viewed later, but whew, these new computers stopped humming. But um, this right here, is I think not a very strong question on what they want you to answer. And our test is usually a lot more clear. We basically lead you. Yeah. It's like, you know, um, just trying to think of questions they've asked in the past. It's pretty obvious it's response bias yeah. because the bias is going to be in the response. Mm -hmm. And then under coverage is like you totally leave out a group. Like you you don't have the right group. Like um, this, the way they're doing the under coverage right there is they only talk to people who go to fast food joints and ask them about Americans' views on obesity. And it's like, wait. We're trying to understand Americans, yeah, so we're undercovering people who don't go to fast food joints. Okay, gotcha. So I, it's, I think it's, a, it's, like it's a decent question, yeah. but then you could say there's response bias. They're coming out of a fast food joint. You got a burger in your hand. They're like, what do you think about obesity? And you're like, it's not a problem. <laughs> I, mean, no, I love burgers, too. So, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Hey, all. Okay, so mm -hmm. I kind of understand this one. So, the sampling and the mean and the standard deviations, how do you do the standard deviations? Yes. So this question was, what is the mean for the distribution of the sample proportion? And so the mean for the distribution of the sample proportion, and I don't, I don't have those notes up now. So I'm going to show uh, these notes right here. And um, so we're talking about the mean for the distribution of the sample proportion. This is still in the video here. So and you are on YouTube now. Obviously, we're talking about that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's go here. Does that have stuff for broadcast? Might stop just a moment here. Go get some food. And let's show this in the thing there. Okay. So they'll hear me talking. Um, so this is in, okay. So uh, what we have right here is the mean for the distribution of the sample proportion is the true proportion. So the formula says mu p hat equals p. Mu p hat equals p. So in the question it states 20% of UT is freshmen. So that is what in this formula? So that'd be the p. That'd be p. You're right. Exactly. So the true proportion of students at UT that are freshmen is 20%. So then this reads, and when we read this right here, it says the mean for the distribution of the sample proportion. That's how that reads right here, because mu is the mean. The mean for the distribution of the sample proportion. So we basically say the same thing that we just did, just now the same mean, which is yep. the sample distribution of 20%. And, and that would be the mean of it. When you draw it out, like in the chapter 13 questions, when you draw your normal curve at the center of that, because think about this, if you went out and took a sample of students, and 20% are freshmen, what percent would you expect to see in your sample? 20%. You expect to see 20% freshmen. But then also, and I think we did this in the question, I'll show it online right here. What you also have to figure out is, oh, let's go here to David M. Lane. David M. Lane applet. So wrong, David M. Lane applet. Um, what you have to do also is you have to use the standard deviation. And the standard deviation, we go right here, go 20%. So that's what we expect to see. And then we go P times Q, and what do we sample 100 in the first example? As long as we, so as you do the sample size, P times Q over N square root. You see, I, we do that right here, and we put this in, and now this is the distribution. So you'd expect to see, like, the most, the most logical thing to see, or most expected thing to see, is 20% freshmen in your sample. You could see 24, you could see 16%, probably not 12, probably not 28, because 12 and 28 are starting to reach towards Z scores of negative this and positive this. You can see them. So 12 is a score of negative thing. Comp down the standard deviations. It is a z score of negative. negative. How many standard deviations is it below? Negative four or two. Negative two. You're right. Yeah, and then 28 is is a z score of positive. Two. And that's where we start to say things are unusual. So if you went out and talked to random students on campus to figure out like what percent of UT is freshmen, and you got something like 40 percent freshmen, well, that's really unusual in your sample. Because we'd take the what we saw in our sample of 40%, we'd subtract that from 20%, and that's how far it is away, right? Yeah. Then you divide that by the standard deviation, and observation minus mean over standard deviation is a 
So basically, this is how many standard deviations it is away. Observation minus mean over standard deviation is the something score. The Z score. Z score, exactly. The Z score. So the Z score is observation minus mean over standard deviation. And I'll say it in a way that sounds like that. We observed 40% in our sample. We expected 20%. The standard deviation was 4. So 40% minus 20% over 4% is a Z score of 5. And imagine if we were to plot this out further, the next number here would be 36. And the next one would be 40% on here because 1Z score, 2Z score, 3, 4, and 5. So that's why we got mm -hmm. asked for this one, trying to find the Z? Correct. And I think we might have used 80 on it because if you notice here, I did, uh, we do P hat times Q hat over N. So 0.2 times 0.8 over 80 uh, divided by 100. I think I just did that. And that's the answer right there, right? Yep. So uh, 0.2 because that was P. And we're using P right here, P times Q over N. And then we do what to it? Yeah. Square root, P times, and you will get the formula on the test, P times Q over N square root. And if you're building a confidence roll, it'd be P hat times Q hat over N square root. Okay, so if we got it, did we just use the normal condition right here? Yes, I see. The standard error is used as an estimate, Mary Kate. The standard error is used as an estimate and the standard deviation is used in chapter 13 as the truth for the sampling distributions. So when you see the confidence intervals, use the standard error. So when you, and we don't usually quiz on the words, so don't worry too much about that. But the standard error of a confidence interval is an estimate of the kind of, uh, the, kind of the, the uncertainty in the interval. So the confidence interval has a standard error where the sampling distributions have standard deviations for the sampling distributions of the sample mean and the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. So I hope that helps out there, Marion. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the people who are still watching. Questions, go ahead, other one. Yeah, so I'm still okay, so I'm still kind of sure. Kidding. So we use these numbers, right? So this is Correct. E. So this, go ahead. That's the E, right? Yep. And then, so this 80 and 30, did you, did you? So this 80 right here, uh, so that P is P, or that point two is P. Mm -hmm. Then how do we find Q? So you multiply this, right? So P is point two. so we'll play the P and Q game, ready? P is 0.2, Q is 0.8. Yep, P is 0.4, Q is 0.6, yeah. And so whenever you hear that the true proportion is something, you can find out the complement of the true proportion by doing one minus. So if you have a crazy number like P is 0.123, then you can do one minus 0.123 and just take the complement. And then, so, so when you do do that, mm -hmm. then you get this number. Correct, and so P would be 0.2, Q would be 0.8, P times Q over N, and N is 80 here, square root. Okay, so this would be the... Yeah, okay. Good job. You're welcome, Mary. And I guess I'm probably going to log... I guess... Did you get another one? Oh, no, this one that I need. Awesome. So, Great so job. You say it is. Did, did it work tonight? Did it... Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. I think I, I love these pens. I love the orange yeah, pens. Yeah, so, so you say it's, it would be P... Times Q. Times Q... Over N. Square root, and then do a whole square root on everything. Like a square root. P times Q over N square root. Okay, thank you. Great job. Awesome. Well, let's let's stop streaming right here. Bye, bye everybody. <laughs> let's.